Hi, and welcome to the episode of Center Nation. My name is Brandon Sparks. And I'm Thomas Horton. And here at Center Nation, we like discussing genre. We like kind of delving into genre and tropes and the history of it. And we are just now ending our month-long study of the Texas genre, the Texas movie genre. And with this new format we've been doing, our last episode of the month will always be a director who has worked within that genre. But first, I want to recap uh, Thomas, the Texas tropes we've talked about this past month. What have, what what makes a Texas movie? Um, well, we've talked a lot about Texas as a, as a land and and the kind of physical and and mental and social ramifications of of the the, the land of Texas. Uh, whether that means yeah. feeling trapped in Texas, we've talked about you know like how how large and vast Texas is and just kind of feeling swallowed up by the vastness of it. Um, a lot of times that's that's shown in, in the movies we've, we've observed with younger people, um, younger people feeling like swallowed up by the vastness of it. Um, yeah. And we've also seen kind of on the opposite end, like the pride of, of the land in Texas, like being being proud of of your ranch. Um, and we've seen that anywhere from from Giant to um, to uh, last week, Hell or High Water, um, talking about, you know, doing anything for your family land. Um, we've also talked about crime and law and order and kind of this duality in Texas. Like it, it is the cowboy state. It's, uh, it's the, the, the land of outlaws, but also the land of Texas Rangers and, and exploring the duality of, of, of both sides of that. Yeah. And, and, and changing of time for sure. We've talked about, yeah. you know, the death of the death of small towns over a long period of time from the last picture show through to hell or high water oil. <laughs> Oil, oil, oil is a big one. I think I don't, I don't know if you touched on it, but like family conflict will happen between, say, a father and son, or kind of the idea of establishing a legacy is another thing that was talked about in Giant, and even to an extent, Hell or High Water. So yeah, that's kind of what takes up kind of the Texas genre. But when it comes to Texas film and Texas movies as a genre. When thinking up a director to talk about that fits within the genre, it felt like the natural choice is Richard Linklater. And maybe, and this, and we'll discuss it here, I don't know if he fully fits into some of the tropes we're talking about, but I feel in terms of Texas as being an outlet for filmmaking and film production and film stories of 90s till now... I think Link, Linklater is a big is the big reason for mm -hmm. that. Like we, we talked in the in the first episode, we talked about kind of the the boom in the '90s of, of indie directors yeah. coming out of Texas, and, and Linklater was was really the first person in that boom. Richard Rodriguez um, would come soon after, and Wes Anderson um, after that. I mean, Ro Robert, 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 Robert Rodriguez. Robert, I'm looking Robert. at I'm looking at Richard Linklater's name written on my screen right now. <laughs> um, yeah, and then Wes Anderson not long after that, but it was it was really Linklater who who showed i mean because link later worked on an even smaller 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 scale than those two i mean and and, and, yeah. and rodriguez yeah. is famous for for being able to work on a shoestring budget and um but but link later was was you know shooting on super eight and cutting on beta at the local um like cable access station um so i, I think i think he's really the person that the the the, the huge kind of texas indie boom uh really brings itself back to him so I, th I think for both of us that was the first person that popped to mind when we were going to talk about like texas directors yeah and, and i think it's also i was listening a little bit to a documentary they did on him i think called 21 years where a lot and i think even just like some pbs doc stuff where they interview a lot of directors that kind of got their start in the 90s or early 2000s and they kind of consider link later along with soderbergh is kind of the first wave of indie filmmakers in america specifically indie filmmakers that were coming outside of the hubs of la or new york yeah well and it was and, also a big time where you know a, a lot of the because it's it's really different from like the film brat movement like we, like we we, we talked yeah. about um bogdanovich a, a few weeks ago bogdanovich was a film brat and you know you've got spielberg and scorsese and and i i think the the 90s indie rise is so different from the rise of the film brats because the film brats were all about taking what they knew about classical hollywood and applying it to low budget whatever they could get their hands on 
in, in the yeah. effort to recreate what they loved about Hollywood. And, and so much of 90s indie cinema, and I think Linklater was a trailblazer in that, was saying, I've got a camera. I don't have to make anything that Hollywood would want me to make. I can make whatever I'm interested in, and it doesn't have to resemble anything that came before it. And, um, uh, and people got really excited about that, but, but, you know, when, when the, when the, the, the exciting thing about the, the film brats was they were, they were making these movies on a very small budget, but they were still these like, like Scorsese, they were still these grand gangster movies in the fashion of, they were exciting and they were new, but it was in the fashion of these older things. And, and you can't, you can't say that like slacker is, is like anything that had come out of Hollywood before. It's just. No, not, not at all. And and even just the indie cinema before, mm. uh, I think I, I, I heard him say in an interview where he was saying, he goes, yeah, he goes like, I, I've never been like, uh, I've never fought in a war. I've never done, I've never done these big things. I've never been like a space traveler or this. And he's like, but I still see my life as cinematic. Like I see drama within my life. I see falling in love. I see, um, conversations that happen he's like i still see I, I i feel like there are stories to tell and i think that's where slacker comes from uh about uh, and it's like in his city of austin and i know i've heard kevin smith says before numerous times as he's like when i saw slacker that was like that was the movie that's like okay i can make a mm-hmm. film he's like that's like what i was like this guy's just doing it and it's like something i've never seen before and it's just people talking and that's what i want to make and like it inspired that that wave of of mid uh, mid nineties uh, indie cinema uh, filmmakers. Um, so I guess we kind of answered why Linklater, and also too because he has such a profound impact on Texas as a as a hub for filmmaking or Austin specifically. It's like I don't I don't know if Austin has a film industry at least not in the way it does now if it wasn't for someone like link later mm-hmm. like I, I i just don't really see it because i think everyone kind of everyone kind of followed suit after that of people like rodriguez people like anderson even people like john sales coming down and shooting in texas with lone star i don't know if that happens without link later and slacker um so background for these episodes we're gonna talk about the background of link later's life and kind of before he got started as a filmmaker and so i'm gonna read a little bit that i have so he was born in houston uh, Houston, Texas, and he moved to East Texas uh, later on in life when he was in when he was in school, uh, Huntsville, Texas, where he went to high school from ninth to tenth to ninth to eleventh grade, and that was kind of the in, or the uh, inspiration for Days and Confused, and it was kind of his autobiographical take on his time at Huntsville, Texas, when he played when he played baseball and when he was going to school. He was the backup quarterback on the football team. He played baseball transferred schools his senior year to play for a better baseball team then he went to sam houston state university where he played baseball and he has basically said uh everybody wants some is kind of his time his freshman year at sam houston state when playing uh baseball one thing i didn't know so he dropped out of high school or dropped out of college and then worked on an offshore oil rig on the gulf of mexico that's very texas <laughs> Like he went off and he would read novels on the rig and he returned home and he started going to like a local repertory theater and that's how he consumed film. But he was basically consuming film theory and watching movies and studying philosophy, but he was never like delving into film production yet. There's a video online you can find, I think it's Richard Linklater on Patience, where he talks about how he was like, I wasn't, he said, I had a film production book about film technique but I wasn't picking it up just yet. I was like, I'm not ready yet. Let me consume as much as I can before I touch that book and start delving into actually making films. So when he came back, he enrolled in Austin Community College and studied film. One of the big things I want to talk about that he did, which is a big kind of influence on the Texas uh, production side of it. So in 1984, I believe, him and his later director of photography for his first few films, Lee Daniel, and Lewis Black, who was, I believe, a, a author for the Texas Monthly uh, at that time, they founded the Austin Film Society. And that was essentially where they were trying to bring hard to find or obscure films to Austin and they would watch them. And it'd be upstairs of a coffee house. 
and it got so big they started to expand and this was a big reason why uh, basically their goal was to at the end push film production and education within the state and it was a big reason why production and education and in a way incentives came to Austin because they had these homegrown filmmakers and Austin Film Society was a big reason for that. And he, and it's still a thing nowadays. Linklater still is a part of the Austin Film Society where they showcase film. They, I think they actually just bought a theater recently in Austin where they've been showing independent films and kind of foreign films. And so also too, Lewis Black, who was one of the, who the co-founders of the Austin Film Society, about a year or two after that, he was asked to, find, uh, to help create a festival which ended up being South by Southwest. So it's like you're seeing at this point in the mid to late 80s a bunch of these kind of uh, like-minded individuals who were interested in film, interested in art, are creating all these things that have essentially become the foundation of what Texas film industry or Texas uh, art industry, entertainment industry has become. There's the brief the brief history of Linklater. Mm -hmm. So he, so after that, in 1985, he makes his first movie. A lot of people think that Slacker's his directorial debut, but it's actually not. It's a second feature. Uh, his first one is It's Impossible to Learn to Plow by Reading Books. Thomas, you believe you have seen this movie. It, I, I, it, <laughs> I, told, I told Brandon, I, I, it feels like a fever dream, which, which the movie in itself, I, I wouldn't call a fever dream, but maybe like a waking dream. Um, I definitely watched this in a film class at some point. I don't remember when. I thought maybe it was when we were in school together, but you say you've never seen it, so it must have been earlier than that. It it feels very him, it, and and you can see why people would would watch it and get excited because it it's something that that if if you if if someone were to make it today, if if anyone I think were to try and recreate this movie, you would like accuse it of being I don't know pretentious and cerebral or something, but it just does not feel that way. It feels utterly sincere when it's coming from him. And it's just him as the main character. Uh, it's not really named. So maybe it is Richard Linklater. Who knows? Um, just traveling, just traveling around Texas on train most of the time and just interacting with people. But like very rarely, there's not a lot of dialogue, which is funny because that's what he would come to be known for. But I imagine it's because he just didn't have access to very good audio, um, recording equipment. But, um, but yeah, it's it's a lot of uh, and and you you see it, you see him bring lots of elements of this into later films. There's kind of the from one interaction to another, much like Slacker does, um, and then a lot of I mean even just like the there's so much in the movie it feels like it's just a camera out a window of a train, which you know would end up being the opening sequence before sunrise. Of before sunrise yeah yeah even even waking life has has train sequences of 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 wiley wiggins character just on a train traveling and then kind of going from person to person and hearing someone give a, a philosoph a philosophical rant of some kind mm -hmm. yeah it's one of those things you, you watch and 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 you know now knowing what he would become it's kind of fun to watch and go oh that's that's richard link later but it, it's it's easy to imagine watching it and just going, what is this? Who 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 is this person? Like I have to find out. Yeah, and so you can find that. I think it's on the bonus feature on Slacker the Criterion Edition. It's also it's on YouTube, so you can view it on YouTube. Someone put it up a few years ago. It's like eighty six minutes, and I think he had Daniel Johnston did the uh, yeah, was a musician. Yeah, you know that's I, I was going to bring it up when you're talking about working with Lewis Black. I've I've always considered, and I texted you the other day and said I think Richard Linklater is an incredible casting director. Um, yeah, but I think overall he's, he's an amazing producer. He, he's someone who is great at gathering talent and you, you hear all these stories specifically yeah. about him gathering cast, but, but, uh, he, 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 he's really good at like surrounding himself with and like picking out talent. And, um, uh, and that's, you know, Daniel Johnston is, is possibly the last great like folk hero. I think, you know, one of those people mm -hmm. that never really broke mainstream, but when he passed last year, everybody, everybody knew him like everybody knew of him at yeah. least when when he died when he died um yeah and to to think that you know he was here in link later's like first little movie that barely anybody else was in is is kind of wild and and you know that he was back there working with lewis black on you know on a daily basis um which is something we'll continue to see especially in his in his third film after it's impossible to learn to plow by reading books he also did a few short films one was called Woodshock, where it was like a, a short little documentary of uh, footage at a a concert or a, a a music festival in Austin, I believe, 
and it's basically just um they're trying to make it look like the like 1960s 70s like kind of like acid trip movies in some way um and i think daniel johnston is also in that one as well um and it was shot by lee daniel and lee daniel was his dp i think for slacker days and confused before sunrise i think before sunset and i'm not i think that's kind of all i did weirdly he did a lot of the earlier ones lee daniel is more known for like um uh documentary type stuff he likes doing documentaries i think his last one they worked together almost fast food nation which has like a documentary quality to it um but i think in term in terms of talking about his dp with lee daniel i think it's very important when looking at something like slack or or even before sunrise where it's a lot of just following Mm -hmm. people and slacker is pretty much that slacker i i came to that movie i think about a year ago and i'd heard like everyone talk about it with kevin smith and all these directors and i'm like let me finally watch this and i i really did not know what to expect for some reason i was thinking something along the lines of clerks in some way just not as like um for lack of a better word crude as clerks mm-hmm. um but i I was actually like really shocked by what was going on in that movie where it's like, you're essentially following and he, and he has the whole speech in the opening of the movie. It's actually linked later in the movie where he gets picked up in a car. I think it's a taxi Mm -hmm. of some kind. And he's talking about this crazy dream he had. And he's talking about like just the ability to, to flow from conversation to conversation. And in a way, like it's essentially um, choose your own adventure the the in the american indie style mm-hmm. where you're starting with link later and then all of a sudden you just start following different people throughout yeah, the, the camera day. just keeps getting passed around yeah and it's insane and I, and just the 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 technical skill to be able to do that where you can able like let me figure out how to carry the camera from this person to this person and it be seamless and i think with lee daniel lee daniel's um experience in uh with documentary it it is a really seamless transition to go from these different stories and it's captivating i don't know if it's a film that i could find myself re-watching over and over again but just especially for the first time seeing it how even today it still has this fresh quality to it and you can tell like this was innovative for the time but the i think the big thing you know if, if you if you saw it's impossible to learn to plow by reading books and you just watched it and you were like you know this is a kid to watch the the thing is when slacker dropped the that's when you get the 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 dialogue that's when you get the richard link later dialogue and and it's it's just no one else can can do it yeah and it has this very naturalistic like feeling to it even in slacker when he's using mostly like i think just mostly his friends so he does slacker and then he moves to dazed and confused which is i mean i'm gonna let you because t- is this your favorite link later film is Daisy yeah, I, think, I think this is his masterpiece uh, uh, okay and, and, unless you if you, i don't it, the only the only time i would like hesitate that is if you gave me the before trilogy as like a solid set if you said it that that counted as like all, as, as one, one I, might, I might i might uh have to debate myself but um but yeah days confused is incredible it is I, I i love this one and and you know maybe it's this thing too if i saw this movie when i was probably around the age of of wiley wiggins in the movie and so yeah. it was like it just hit me but um i i think it is one of the best ensembles just in the way it handles an ensemble yeah um from from technical standpoints from plot standpoints from story standpoints i, I love I, I was i showed it to my girlfriend for the first time um about a month ago and, and I, I one of the things i've always loved about this movie and i said it to her was it feels like one of the most realistic high school movies especially when i was in high school and i was watching it because there's there are like clicks but they're not like hard drawn lines it's just all about i love the, the way the movie flows and it's just the stoner hops in the car with the jock and and the you know the the geeks will come hang out with them and, and everyone is just has their social circles that are all interacting all at the same time yeah and, and very few high school movies do that. A lot of them kind of just have followed the John Hughes template of these are the cliques. Everyone's divided. They're not going to interact mm-hmm. when like my high school is like I was the head of head of the drama department. But some of my best friends were playing baseball, 
playing basketball, playing football. They were in the band. It was like it it was very much like this there were like you didn't you didn't have to find clicks that mm-hmm. way. The skater kids were were like really good friends with the cheerleaders. Like it was just like it really wasn't as uh cut and dry as what a lot of high school films do. And Days and Confused is probably that one. And then I would argue as well, American Graffiti, which is kind of the two films that really do this well, is that it definitely captures that authenticity of being in high school and having friends where like, oh, it's that friend from elementary school that you've known for years. He became a geek, but you play baseball, but you're still best friends. Mm. Like that's just kind of what he captures in the movie. Yeah, and I, and I think so so many films within the like high school genre are so heightened. It's like, you know, there's drama and all this stuff. And this feels like, it, it's it's i don't want to say aimless because that has a negative connotation to it but it but it just flows on its own and that feels more realistic yeah. to what the experience of being a teenager is um i think to me at least but yeah i i absolutely i can I, this is one of those movies there's there's not a long list of them but this is one of those movies i could watch every day and just never get sick of it there's there's something new every time you come back and it and it builds the characters build and the, the relationships you have with everyone just just keeps growing yeah it's a i i I heard in in a in a video essay at some point about i think they were talking about american graffiti but they kind of brought dazed and confused where there are these two films where it feels like they're not a love letter to a time they feel like a love letter from that era Mm -hmm. like you look at certain kind of coming of age like high school movies and it feels like you're writing about a previous time and you're and you're adding your own kind of like new perspective to it so that's why some of the kids talk uh older and and wiser than what they probably should be but dazed and confused has that ability where it feels like this is 1976 and it has that realistic vibe to it that's not really present in other films so i I don't know if you know this i was gonna read it off what the movie was originally supposed to be no let me let me so the original movie was way, way more experimental the whole movie was going to take place in a car with the characters driving around listening to ZZ Top. It would have been two shots, one guy putting in an eight track of ZZ Top's Van Dango, and then one of two guys driving around talking. And the film would have been the length of the actual album, and you'd hear each track in the background as the source, is what the DP Lee Daniel said. So what, how would the movie would have been like if it was just him listening to ZZ Top in the car? And also, if you did that, what two characters do you pick? Oh, man. Uh... Ooh, that's tough. Who do I want to be in a car with for for two? I, I mean, I think you got to go Slater. I think Slater's got to be in that car. <laughs> is it just Slater and Wooderson? Is that is that what? It is? Honestly, Don. Don's my favorite character in the whole movie. I I absolutely. And it, it it every time I watch that movie, it kills me a little bit inside that that actor never went on to do anything. He's so good in this. No, there, there's there was one of them that I felt like it was Sean Andrews. That's not Don. There was one. It was Kevin. There was oh, one yeah, I heard for, like yeah. He, no, he he screwed himself over. Yeah, that that's a famous. He was supposed to be the lead character in the movie. No, or something. he was supposed to be Wooderson. So the character um, who plays who plays Kevin, they call him Pickford or Pick. Um, he was supposed to be with them throughout the whole movie. And he and Mila Jovovich started dating in real life. They were dating in the movie. They started dating in real life and they just like would not show up to set and just like not yeah. get involved at all. And, and, and um, Linklater's whole thing in this was like everyone was hanging out, whether they were shooting or not. Like so everyone is a group. We're all friends. We're all hanging out and they like would not participate. So he wrote him out of the movie basically and then was the story was he was down in the in the hotel bar and was like trying to figure out what to put back into these scenes where he had had Pickford this whole time and this kid from that went to UT Austin was like hanging around the hotel because he heard a movie was happening and he wanted to get involved and <laughs> and Matthew McConaughey was born from there. <laughs> it's a, that's such a crazy story. It's just like. Talk about just like, not, I mean, a little bit of luck, but also just like McConaughey being like, yeah, I'm the, gonna sheer get in this movie. Like, the sheer power of will. The sheer power. I'm going to hang out. And that's what he said. He said this. He, he just started. He was like, yeah, I mean, all the, we all hung out in this hotel together. Like, all the kids would like hang out in the lobby. And like, he just said one day someone noticed that this like kid from 
the college and just like attached himself to the group and he was just suddenly around all the time and i was like okay and and i and i read i heard uh he said that when mcconaughey the first time mcconaughey showed up in the scene that's when they knew they had a movie mm-hmm. like all the cast was into this dude and it was just like this is the this like this is this is where they all knew okay this is gonna be a good movie when this guy just shows up and it's just so natural <laughs> like when you hear mcconaughey talk about he was just like i just had to figure out my character and we're driving up and i was just like i'm all about four things and i got three of them and i'm going for my fourth and that's a woman and that's like the 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 geeky like redheaded girl who hangs out with adam goldberg yeah, and, sister. Anthony, and, and, and anthony rapp yeah, it's it's insane. And I also dazed and confused too. Another thing I was hearing about Ethan Hawke was talking about it. He was like, I love Slacker, and he was like, I was in a play with Anthony Rapp, and he was like, Anthony Rapp was just like, Hey, I, I have like tickets for this movie I was in. Uh, do you want to go with me? And Ethan Hawke's like, Yeah. And it was dazed and confused. And Ethan Hawke was just like, I I done Dead Poet Society. Like I was I was like feeling kind of good about myself, and like I was I was a working actor. And he's like, And I watched Dazed and Confused, and it was just painful because i wanted to be in this movie <laughs> like i he was like i want wow. to can live you imagine, in can this you movie Ethan Hawk is, is pink that would have been interesting i think jason london's good i, I love jason I, london in this yeah, the only I, person the only person i have problems with in this movie is wiley wiggins and bless his heart he's 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 sincere as can be someone just needed to step in and tell him to stop pinching the bridge of his nose because that is his <laughs> that is his crutch and and he <laughs> He just blows it every scene when he does that. <laughs> but I, I still love him. I love him. my one of my favorite scenes in the movie. I, I mean, as, as many incredible cast members are in this movie, my, my favorite scene in this movie is when he's buying beer. <laughs> <And> he, <laughs> he just like recites back what he's been hearing Matthew McConaughey say. I love that scene so much. <laughs> the, the clerk is just like, yeah, I hear you. Here's more money for your pocket. It's oh, man, it's so good. So, Dazed and Confused comes out. Uh, it doesn't do phenomenal. $8 million on the box office for a $6.9 million budget. But it's a huge hit on, like, home video. It's one of those movies that begs for a rewatch. And it, yeah. it's, there's something very specific. The Coens do it really well. You know, uh, I, I think something like, I don't know, Wet Hot American Summer. Like, there's mm-hmm. something, and it's, there's a specific type of humor, and it's really hard to hit. But it's like the first time you watch it, you're like, that's funny. And then the next time you come back, you're like, oh, my God, this is hilarious. Like, yeah. Why did I not realize this the first time I watched it? I don't know. I can't describe it. It is it is untouchable. It's like when it's like these days when you hear like a a company say like, oh, we're going to go viral. Like, no, you can't. (laughs) You can't plan viral. Yeah. There there are no like there's, there's no numbers. There's nothing like of value in going viral. It just happens. And I think. Yeah this this type of i mean there's there's cult when it's like cult like schlocky or like you know rocky horror or something like this is a different kind of like it's just a comedy that that works best if you've seen it 20 times yeah and there's no way to describe it there's no way to like pick that apart and also just introduced us to so many people in this film with Affleck, with Ben Aff or with, with McConaughey, with Affleck, with, uh, Parker Posey, with, uh, uh, Jerry Lauren Adams. I mean, Renee Zellweger without a speaking role. Yeah, without a speaking like. role. Like it's just, it's, it's crazy. So he does Dazed and Confused, but it feels like he, he, he has a great, he can have a great one, two punch. And the first one's Dazed and Confused. And then his left hook is Before Sunrise. Mm-hmm. Like you go from Dazed and Confused to Before Sunrise. And so, so Thomas, we both rewatched Before Sunrise. Actually, here's a question. Should we talk about that, about this trilogy as a whole or in the confines of like the, chron- like the chronological view of, of Linklater's career? I, I think, I think we should, I think we should cover the basics okay. as we're going through the chronology and then save a little bit of time at the end to come back and just discuss this as a piece because, because like dropping before midnight in what 2015 i think it was like 2012 okay it, it like begs you to 2012 like, it is a piece it is it is yeah. one solid piece and um this this was the first time i've watched it as one solid piece um i i never same i, I never attempted that before and a friend of mine I, I i posted about it on social media that i was doing it and a friend of mine said you know a lot of people are doing that during quarantine um, that's weird that's an interesting choice I, I think it's maybe something that like everyone had always intended to do in their minds and like had never had never gone for it 
it's not a long watch i mean i, I know plenty of people not. who watch sit and watch all the lord of the rings all the way through like this is about the length you do them one. all at once it would be about the length of one director's cut of lord of the rings <laughs> Yeah, especially, I mean, yeah, before sunset's 80 minutes long. It's it's a breeze. So before sunrise happens, it was inspired by a a night uh, Rick Lincoln said he was traveling and he was in Philadelphia and he met this, I think he met this woman, I think either at a record store or a, uh, a, a coffee shop. I don't know, maybe it was a waitress. He meets this woman and he's like, essentially, I, he's like, I did something I'd never done before. And I essentially like asked her out like, hey, I'm in town for the night. Do you want to like kind of hang out and get a drink or whatever? And she said yes. And they ended up basically walking around the rest of the night in Philadelphia and just talking about every, like everything they can think of. And that was the inspiration before before sunrise. And I feel like the first one, and we'll delve into it more, but the first one is the more like romantic of the three like this is like the pure like romanticism of these two characters of two trains cross it's the the brief encounter two trains crossing for a brief time they spend one night together and the question at the end of the movie is will they get back together will they not like Mm -hmm. think about for the first nine years i've seen before sunrise of just like having to assume do they meet again does does he show did they they meet meet six months six months later and yeah, that's just like, I, I, I think it's it's it, the, this movie like each movie captures something separate about human interaction, and this one is about a moment when when you meet somebody new and you know, or at least at the beginning, you think you're never going to see them again, and just the opportunity that gives you to just like bear yourself. your most authentic yeah. self to them because you don't have to worry like you you've never showed them anything of yourself before, and you don't have to worry that much about what they think of you because you don't think you're ever going to see them again and um it's yeah it's it's wild it's wild that he pulled this off i mean it, it having seen slacker you would have known that he would be able to do this but to to be able to work it even smaller you know to just make it two people the whole time and then to have mainstream success is insane so he does before sunrise and here here's where i want to get to thomas <laughs> if you're looking if you're looking at the rundown mm-hmm. oh i see i see the i see the so, list so <laughs> So he does before sunrise and in this next film he does. I have heard many people say it is the forgotten link later film that you should discover because of it's, it's set in Austin. Some people will try to pitch it as like a, a, a dark sequel to dazed and confused. I mean, even Roger Ebert gave this movie a good review. <laughs> even Roger, what are you trying to say here? Brent? <laughs> so this, this film called suburbia and is about these, kind of all these friends it's after high school i think they're some they're in college but they're all stuck in austin or actually they're all stuck in like a a suburb of texas it's it's a fictional suburb and it all takes place in one night again kind of like dazed and confused and they're all just hanging out at a convenience store gas station and one of their old friends who has kind of become this successful musician is coming to town and everyone's kind of like reflecting on their lives since then and like wondering if this guy's changed and the premise sounds like a link later film so i had seen this before thomas has never seen this before Thomas, what were your thoughts on Suburbia? So I think, you know, as we're approaching this chronologically from like Linklater's standpoint, it has to be clear this is the first movie he's made that he's not had any hand in the script, or at least is not credited. Correct. Yeah, for yeah, having yeah. any hand in the script. Yeah. Um, yeah, I found this movie extremely problematic. I was very deeply disturbed by it and like viscerally disliked this film. Okay. <laughs> like was disgusted. And I, 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 I I don't get disgusted by many things and I'm, I'm pretty high tolerance when it comes to movies, but, um, and, and it, and it took me, I, I was texting you during it and after I was done and it took me some reflecting on it to really figure out what it was that, um, that, that made me feel that way. And I, and I think what I, what I ended up with was, um, link later's strength as a director, as a writer, as whatever he does, you know, to manipulate time and space to make a movie, his strength is, is putting you right there. You never, and, and I think it it goes back to, maybe it goes back to his early style being influenced by working with Lee Daniel, but he has a very naturalistic style. I've never seen a Linklater movie where I was ever aware of the camera ever. 
Like he's 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 not trying to impress you with like where he puts the camera and he's not trying to do anything with the camera that you probably wouldn't be able to do yourself. Yeah. And so by doing that, he makes you feel like you were there. Days confused. You were in the car with those people. And that's part of the reason why I think there's such like a warmth to it and why it feels very like, like a, like comfort food sometimes, at least to me, this movie, I do not want to be around these people. And I think if it was, if it like I told you, if, if it was shown to me as a play and there was a proscenium between me and the people there, because a play a play is essentially your something you watch where a film is oftentimes something you experience. It's, it's a little yeah. more immersive. And I think if I was watching this as a play, I would be able to say, wow, those people are awful, but I'm glad I, I don't have to meet any of them because they are awful. Everyone in that movie is, <laughs> is awful. The characters, uh, not, not, not the actors. No, right? not the but, actors, but like Steve Zahn, who is, it's weird. Like Steve Zahn is doing his like Steve Zahn thing where he is yeah. like, borderline annoying but like charming but doing it and being racist and misogynistic at the same time so like it, you don't know how to feel and um nikki cat from uh from days confused is just the absolute worst yeah. like he is no one should be around this person he should probably be in jail but we're we're there in the parking lot with him acting like he's our best friend and it it made me feel gross it made me feel and, and 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 that's the thing I said. You know, you would probably see this as a success. This is Linklater doing what he does best. He is putting you right there. He is making you feel like you know these people, like you are around these people, like you're in this gas station parking lot with these people. But but because this is a script that is not natural to him, it feels like they're working against each other. I I if if I somehow watch this and I could say, okay, those people are very far away from me. I can watch their lives be bad and I can watch them be awful people. Mm -hmm. But because Linklater's directing it, like I am right there, like I am, you know, walking the streets of Vienna with Jesse and Celine or, you know, all the walking the streets of Austin and slacker. Like I, I am right there and I do not want to be, it makes me extremely uncomfortable to want. So to you're, be you're, you're, you're almost saying that because he's such a good director, it yes. makes you hate no i'm people. absolutely saying that i'm absolutely saying that someone else directing this would probably not have the ability to drop you into that parking lot the way that link later does and what yeah. really got to me like i can watch movies about terrible people i can watch american history x and say wow that guy is a awful awful racist murderer but i can watch his journey with this movie, they have some extremely racist. The, many of the main characters are extremely racist and misogynistic and violent, but but you're you're supposed to be there with with them, and I, I couldn't handle that. I could not handle that. It feels like none of them are like good friends to each other. Like no, they're all they're, all, they're all. There's no reason for any of them to be the the two that are dating. There's no reason for them to be in a couple, and they don't really learn anything. Like maybe by the end, you see Giovanni, you know, Giovanni Ribisi's character like go like oh what am i doing this is this is not a good place to be but no one learns anything and this is another thing we've, we've talked about with the texas genre because i do think suburbia fits into this texas stuff that we're talking about with texas tropes we're talking about and you have giovanni ravisi who is this guy who's stuck in in his tail in texas and it was a he helped start the band that his friend went off and has become famous with and it's like he's now become trapped when he's starting to see even some of his friends like Steve Zahn and his girlfriend where they're like now getting opportunities to go move to Los Angeles to like do follow their dreams. And he's kind of just sitting here in Texas, like what the hell's happening. But I will say the one big thing about this movie. So that I, I think doesn't really work for me with, with Linklater, a lot of his films, he's obsessed with time and he'll put time constraints on his films in some way where it's in one night or if it's in a real time aspect or if it's in one day or if it's in three days like everybody wants some there's something about the time where he's just obsessed with it even his characters are talking about the passage of time and what it's going to be like in memory and this is the one movie where it feels like the time and the constraint that it puts doesn't work Dazed and Confused feels like one night, and it's it's kind of a breeze. Suburbia feels very slow, and I'm not sure how it's one night. Because there's mm. so much stuff that happens in it where I'm like, I don't feel like there's enough time for mm -hmm. all of this. Where, like, one guy goes to jail, then he gets out of jail. One guy gets ready to, to move to L.A. These people are working. There's a concert. It's like so much happens in one night 
but it never feels realistic if that makes sense mm. like it's like the convenience store owner who is is good in this movie has like multiple run-ins with these guys and i'm just like wait it feels like you've forgotten about the previous run-in which was probably only 30 minutes ago and the way this film is established so just something about it just that that doesn't click for me yeah and if you're if you're looking for a, t- a texas movie i might i recommend days and confused instead <laughs> We didn't really touch on that, but I mean, there is yeah. a lot of those themes of being stuck. And especially, I mean, if we're, if we're trying to draw, you know, all these, if we're trying to draw parallels between all these Texas movies we've talked about specifically with yeah. Last Picture Show, there's there's, there's the, the very same, like, I don't know if it's necessarily a metaphor, but like this idea of like the adults in the town being way too invested in the high school football team and the actual players of the high school football team not caring that much. Um I, I love there's a there's a it's a really quick and it's just like an establishing uh, sequence to get pink into a certain scene. But there's just a, a shot where we open on this old couple like talking to pink and he we've already heard him like debating whether or not he's going to play football next year. And it's just this like really, really old guy like walking alongside him and he's like gripping his arm and he's like, is this arm ready to throw us all the way to, um, to the uh, playoffs next year? And Pink's like, yeah, yeah I guess so. And he said, we really depend on you boys. And I mean, that's like straight out of, of um, Last Picture Show. Like this, this yeah. uh, you know, you can see you can see this young person who plays football every weekend and is just like, yeah, it's fine. And, but like seeing all these adults and being like, is this my future? Is this what I have to look forward to is like watching other teenagers play football for the, yeah, rest, of for the rest of my life. <laughs> well, and, th- and then you have the scene, I think, at the end where it's like when they're on the football field. And I th- is this where he says, like, I don't want keep- these to be... Yeah, well, I don't want to in. Oh yeah, yeah. If these are the best, if I ever call these the best days of my life, shoot, shoot me. Yeah, like it's very much like, please don't. Like, I don't want football in high school to be the big, biggest thing in my life. But suburbia is the, is the one. Yeah, I would say n- not watch. Like, it, it definitely has some of the tropes that he's been playing with in earlier films, and I think you also you get the kind of essence of suburban life which you're going to see repeated in a couple of films like Fast Food Nation. But yeah, I don't want to spend too much time on Suburbia. I just know Thomas really did not like this movie. <laughs> well, I, I think one of my initial reactions, I sent you like 15 minutes into it, as I said, what, I, what I'm what i running up against right now is is I've always felt Linklater as a, in, an extremely earnest writer and director. And this movie feels cynical and yeah. in, a, in a way that doesn't feel and like there's him. and there's no balance like you can you can argue before sunrise that like at first like jesse is a cynic who's or he's a he's a romantic posing as a cynic mm-hmm. so and then you'll get later on with before sunset there is some cynicism to it but there's always that balance of cynicism and romanticism and it's always earnest is, it's always yeah. open and, and it never feels like it's putting anything on and and suburbia just feels like a black hole of cynicism to me it 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 just it it brought me down man it did okay moving on from suburbia real quick to the newton boys one of the ones i'd never seen before yeah i didn't even know it existed until you put this until you put this list together yeah uh link layers really first i think outing into like studio filmmaking with the newton boys where it's essentially telling the story of this these bank robbing brothers uh, starring Matthew McConaughey, Ethan Hawke, uh, Vincent D'Onofrio, and Ski Ulrich, and also Dwight Yoakam is like the not a brother, but the guy who like knows how to like he's like the rig mentor. He's the, he's the one yeah. who, who taught McConaughey how to how to how to rig up bombs. And uh, it's kind of like showcasing the the transition from Jesse James type bank robbery to like blowing up bank or blowing up uh, vaults to steal money at and the at, at night. And it's like kind of like the transitioning in the modern era of bank robbing. What were your thoughts on the Newton boys? I thought it was fun. It's a little long. It's not perfect in any sense. No. But um, I, I texted you. I, I said I was surprised it didn't have a life on cable. Yeah. And I'm sure it was some kind of studio, you know, licensing and that kind of stuff. But it felt like a movie that would have done well. You know, if you turned on WGN on the weekend in like 2003, yeah. You would have gone, oh, what is this with like four famous guys in it and sit and watch it? Yeah, it was, it was a good time. Yeah, it, it definitely is a movie that kind of follows the link later, like not lack of structure, but just like it has that flow where it's not your typical like heist movie. 
Mm-mm. It's just it's very much why why the the first half of the movie I think works more than the second half of the movie because mm-hmm. I think because it's so long you're kind of you're losing the charisma these guys have together. Mm-hmm. Uh, like yeah. like w- one of my favorite scenes in that movie is like I think when they're robbing the first bank and Ethan Hawke and uh, Ski Ulrich are on the lookout and Ethan Hawke just starts yelling at a woman <laughs> who's like what are you guys doing go back to bed. <laughs> Ethan Hawke was, was fantastic. And I love Ethan Hawke, but like just just letting him be like a supporting role was so much fun yeah he's the one that like didn't did, never thought about being a bank robber but once mcconaughey like brings him into it he's great at it like he's he, like he, i'm so down yeah <laughs> honestly though my favorite part of the movie was in the end credits when they have the skeet Ulrich's character the real the real guy on johnny carson at like 80 it, and that was, like, oh that yeah was, we used to rob banks <laughs> that was so much fun I, I i sat and watched that i was like i would i would watch more of this and apparently there is a documentary about them out but um yeah they, 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 and they bring it up in kind of the end title crawl is like they're they're part of the reason they're so famous is because they were one of the only bank robbers from that era to grow into old age and um yeah. because they didn't, they, because out, they didn't murder being outlaws yeah. yeah because they they specifically did not murder anybody they weren't uh punished as long and so they got out of prison and all became old men <laughs> all lived then, it like to, to, and all lives like in their 80s or 90s yeah insane but yeah mcconaughey oozes charisma in this movie which i think is i mean i i think this movie is kind of forgettable i do think if you chop like a half hour off of it mm-hmm. and make it look yeah, more tired cut it, cut it for tv i mean you can't do that anymore but if you if they had cut it for television you know they used yeah. to trim 20 minutes off of it yeah um yeah, I think it would have done well. Yeah, I, I think because I, I do think it's it's kind of his version of the sting. Like it feels like he's trying like the, the look of it, the style of it has this like sting quality. Yeah. And you still got some um, you still got some Texas themes in there. Like you've got McConaughey talks a couple of times about, you know, growing up poor and in Texas and this being the only way they could get out. Like you could, you know, there's there's a cycle, you know, we, we've talked about it before. There's the, and, and hell or high water has the same thing. You know, there's this cycle of being poor and um, Chris Pine calls it a disease and yeah. hell or high water. And, and these guys said, yeah, this was, this was the only way we could do it. And, and robbing from the banks was the best way too. There's a lot of hell yeah. or high water parallels yeah, in this. That, the funny part, they buy an oil, oil rig and they don't have any oil. Yeah. They're just like, they put all their money in this oil rig and they're just like, well, Standard Oil has that land, so they've drained your oil from over there. Mm-hmm. Like, it's like, we just spent all of our money from Robin Banks to buy oil and we're not getting any oil. Um, so yeah, it's it's definitely one of his lesser outings, but it's interesting seeing Link Flair work on a studio form. And production design's great. Production and, design, and I, thought to, I thought was great. I, I just really enjoyed seeing him and McConaughey back, like the first time they were back together after he had like launched him, you know? Yeah. So moving on into one brief one year uh 2001 i can't call, i'm calling it 2001 an experiment because two of his more experimental films are happening in 2001 also i believe he starts shooting a movie in 2001 that's very experimental and that's boyhood i can't wait i can't wait everyone listeners stay tuned because brandon <laughs> has not told me what he thought on his rewatch yet and i'm so excited it's 2001 he, ha- he has tape and he has waking life and tape is a I, I I I was wrong when I texted you that Before Sunset was his only real time movie. Tape is a real time movie, and it takes place on a, a a motel room. And he shot it with a camcorder. I think we've talked about this film before on our twenty four hour way back, almost a year and a half ago now. Uh, where it's 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 a uh, Ethan Hawke, uh, Uma Thurman, and Robert Sean Leonard, and it's basically it's a reunion movie. And actually, we talked about reunion movies. I believe is what it was. And they're all getting back together. And Ethan Hawke's character has a secret he needs to reveal that she doesn't know about. And it's all it's all shot with the camcorder. And so what's weird about it is that he's really experimenting with like where can I put this digital camera? I think it's his really first time playing with digital cinema. And it's so interesting of just the way he's moving the camera. And so you're seeing him experiment with that. And then Waking Life is his like first rotoscoping movie where he essentially shoots the movie and then they animate it on top of the live action film. And Waking Life is kind of a little bit like Slacker where you have Wally Wiggins who is essentially walking around. I think it's Austin. I'm not sure if it actually says in the movie, but essentially he's having a dream and he's going from like philosophical conversation to philosophical conversation. And so I feel like both in 2001 that with both these films, 
link layers just like all of a sudden like after um probably the failure maybe the failure of the newton boys made him just like go back like hey let me just experiment some stuff and try new things that i couldn't do in the newton boys and then you had the you had the beginning of boyhood and so yeah it's just a weird interesting time for him in terms of experimenting that he i feel like he's he's working up to what ends up becoming peak link later i feel like so in 2003 2004 and that school of rock and before sunset school of rock is probably i feel like at least in terms of our generation maybe i'm wrong maybe days and confuses it what for you but i feel like school of rock is the first movie where our generation was introduced to link later as a director oh well, yeah i mean absolutely. when we didn't I, yeah. I, I, I was introduced to school of rock before i was aware of like you know i, I knew steven As spielberg directors. but like i wasn't yeah, like yeah. I, I didn't watch that movie and go who directed this but um school of rock did school of rock introduced me to classic rock which became Same. my defining musical genre through all of middle and high school sometimes i feel like thompson and I are the same person had the same the, exact the school, of rock, the school of rock cd <laughs> was like my Same. education Same. into classic rock until i got classic rock gold <laughs> which essentially i i brought in i think i was in like seventh or eighth grade and i and i was like yeah i love classic rock and my my one of my teachers was like oh you gotta you gotta tell me about what you you know what what songs do you like and i brought in i had a cd i bought that was just it was one of those you know they made the it was like so and so gold it would yeah, just yeah. be like a collection of greatest hits and there was one called classic rock gold and i remember i brought it in and i like showed her i was like this is this is my cd and she looked at it and she goes, this is just basically the Dazed and Confused soundtrack. And I said, what's Dazed and Confused? And that was... <laughs> oh, yeah. Unknowingly, Linklater has been a big part of our lives. I, I asked my mom to get me School of Rock, the soundtrack. I think she like went to our local music store. Shout out Oz Music in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. And like ordered School of Rock for me. And that was like... I mean, for the longest time, sadly, that was the only Led Zeppelin song I knew was the immigrant song off that <laughs> off that album and substitute by the who. Yeah, School of Rock. I, and I will argue this, too, is that I feel like Jack Black has given his best performances in Linklater movies. Mm. I think with School of Rock and with Bernie, I would you would I would argue are his two best performances he's ever had. And it's maybe because Link, maybe Linklater knows where to like with school of rock. It's, it's probably the closest we'll see Jack black as Jack black on screen. And then Bernie feels like, but one also, of, but also like, I don't know. It's, it's, it's Jack black, but it's like tolerable. Level. I mean, Jack black can be too much. Sometimes I love, like I've been to a tenacious D concert. I know what like pure unadulterated Jack black is. <laughs> okay. And that's the, that's the, 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 crazy thing about school of rock and it's and it's kind of like you know certain movies like 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 truman show that like harnesses all the best yeah. of jim carrey without the the it's punch stuff, club the yeah. grading stuff you know the stuff yeah. that can annoy you um and i think that's that's what school of rock somehow threads that needle where it, it is pure unadulterated jack black but not to the point where you're like okay that's like he's still realistic he's still like a, a human being which sometimes jack black can can be like inhuman and his level of like energy and and how then like bouncing off the walls and i i think one of his best pieces of acting comes in school of rock when tamika the girl who comes like hey i want to be a singer he's like well you're a roadie or whatever and she starts singing i think aretha franklin yeah, it's, it's chain of fools and jack black's face just goes like it's like he just found out god existed <laughs> like it's just he he is so like like he's about to start weeping. Like his face goes from like, oh no, you're Rhodey. And then she just all of a sudden bursts into song. And it's just like, oh my God, what is this? Like, it's just, it's, it's for, for just a brief second. He doesn't say anything, but I think it's one of his best reactions he's ever given in film. Uh, and Linklater really with School of Rock melds the studio style and indie style very well. But when he's singing like Legend of the Rent or whatever it is, and it's this long tracking shot of of jack black doing it and it's just slowly moving backwards revealing the rest of the class and i forgot about it because it's such a it helps the awkwardness of that moment and the comedy of that moment where it slows it down and you're not cutting and getting coverage of it and it just works so well and he does that a lot in some of these movies where it's like these studio films that he takes these longer takes and it it definitely adds to the tension or adds the drama or adds the comedy 
Um, he even has these like long shots of POVs that you'll pop up in like bad news bears and things. Yeah, well, I, th I think too, one of the things you got to bring up when you're talking about the success of School of Rock and specifically like him f fitting with School of Rock is, is one thing you see when you look through his career is that he is not necessarily a director who works well with someone else's script. Yeah. But I do think you have to acknowledge the the weird like way that everything influences everything. Mike w Mike White wrote this script. Mike White was one of the main writers for uh for Freaks and Geeks. Yep. The, Freaks and Geeks is very heavily influenced by Days Confused. And so there's some kind of weird synergy going on there where you've got Mike White who I'm sure looked to Days Confused a lot as he was developing as a writer who then ends up writing School of Rock, which Link later directs, and it just works perfectly. Like, I think this is not only one of his strongest films, but I think this is easily the best film that he did with someone else's script. I would, I would agree with you on that. And what's weird about School of Rock is, like, it's weirdly, it's been his most successful, like, in terms of everything. It was his biggest box office success, made $131 million dollars, well received critically jack black got a golden globe nomination also by the way jack black's two golden globe nominations come from school of rock and bernie so there you go he brings out the best broadway adaptation by andrew lloyd weber yeah uh, tv uh, show franchise <laughs> tv show on nickelodeon franchised into a an actual school of, of rock <laughs> of rock I got an email recently telling me I should I should buy a School of Rock franchise. I don't know how I got on that email <laughs> list, but I was like, you know what? Of all the of all the weird franchise emails I get, that that's that, the that's most tempting That's what I would one. do. That's tempting. So he does School of Rock, 03, and then Before Sunset is 04. Briefly, I'll just go ahead and say it. I think this is the best Before movie. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think it's just, it's, it's, it's a breeze. I love the whole reunion aspect weirdly i think i saw this movie before i saw before sunrise i feel like i bought before sunset at this movie movies plus i believe is what it was uh in my town where we just bought i bought used dvds and i think this had like oscar nominated screenplay or like two thumbs up by roger ebert and i was like i gotta buy that and so i think i watched this one before i watched the first one and this one the way it shot the steady cam stuff is great uh, Julie Delpy, Delpy and Ethan Hawke pick right back up where they left off. And it's amazing to behold. Yeah, it's and, and I think I, I having watched it as a as a block, I think one of the things I took away from it new is that the before sunrise is about two people falling in love and before sunset is like is also about two people falling in love. And it's not necessarily two people falling in love again. Like it it's. They, they've they you're watching them having changed and matured and and being almost different people falling in love in a different way and and i think that's incredible that they pulled that off because a lot of times if you watch a sequel to a romance it's either about them breaking up or it's about them breaking up and getting back together or it's about them falling in love again and, and a lot of times that feels inauthentic or it feels like it cheapens the first movie um, and this this one pulls off it's the almost the exact same energy from the first one just just nine years later and it and it works 100 percent and and yeah i think i think choosing to do this one in real time the the first one flows the script flows like it is real time and visually we're jumping around because there it takes place over what 10 hours or 12 hours or yeah, yeah. um and so visually, we do have to jump around to establish that sense of time. But with this one, the the, the script just just goes. We we pick up with them, and and we we have an hour and twenty minutes with them, and we watch them fall in love in an hour and twenty minutes. And, and he has that ticking time bomb of like he has a plane to catch. Mm -hmm. And the question and that last is, line is incredible. You're you're gonna miss that. You're gonna miss that flight. And uh it's now and it's 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 subvert it's kind of taking what happened the first one where they separate and this one's like now are is he going to leave or is he going to stay what's going to happen and you're left with kind of not knowing mm. and but yeah it's like the the scene that gets me is the scene in the taxi mm -hmm. when they're driving back to her place and it feels like they've been having kind of the romantic kind of like romantic conversation they had in the first one and they're getting to know each other. And the reoccurring question is why didn't you show back up to Vienna? Why weren't you there? 
And then finally, all the frustrations that have kind of built up through the conversation, through the years of not seeing each other, all just come out uh, in the taxi cab. And you're seeing not just their frustrations with each other, but also like how they've kind of become like hurt people over the years. Mm -hmm. Like they've been hurt by other people. And it's these moments where like when, when, when Celine turns, Ethan Hawke kind of like reaches out to her, but then pulls his hand back. And then she does the same thing a few minutes later. I love it. And it, it's a, it's a parallel that my favorite scene in the first one is right before they kiss on the Ferris wheel. There's a, there, it just lets them sit there for a minute. Yeah. And, and, um, and like, he's looking at her and then like when she turns, he'll look away and it's very like intimate and like, Oh, well they want they, and, and, yeah. and he, he brings that back in this one and, and it feels almost more intimate because now they're, they're, and, 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 and that's what I, I love about this trilogy is it explores, you know, the idea that like, once you become like, they, they have a little argument in the first one, but like, it's not much. And then they, they both say like, Oh, we only have this night. Let's not argue. Yeah. And, and, and the, the trilogy explores them. And, and, you know, as you get into a deeper relationship with someone, you can argue with them and, and you have time to argue. Yeah, I love that. I, I think my favorite moment is is very early on, but uh, they're both fantastic. And when she she says uh, something about he, he says, did you did you go to Vienna? And she says, no. And did you? And he says, no. And yeah. you can tell immediately that he he's did. lying. And, but it takes her, it takes her a couple of minutes to realize it. Um yeah. Also, shout because because Linklater's used the same editor over and over again with uh, with Sandra Adair, mm -hmm. but her editing is so damn good. And the scene in Before Sunset when he's at the when he's at the uh, the when he's talking about his book and he's selling his book at the bookstore, it's when he's when they're cutting back and forth between like the time and and like he's telling the story about when he saw celine or or this fictional character he's created and it's showing their their moments back and forth the present to the past and then it cuts and it's of her standing in the bookstore and it's just like oh damn it's just such a like we've skipped all these this all this time and it's like finally she's here and he's built it up in his head so much and now it's like oh no like, it's not oh no but it's like Oh wow, the thing he's always dreamed of of running into that girl again, she's now standing ten feet away from him. And the mm -hmm. way that's edited is perfect. So the next four movies, I kind of call the lost years. I'm not saying these movies are bad, because I actually like most of these. But we'll run through them. So we got Bad News Bears, which I think is his only remake he's ever done. And it's fine. It's like I think Billy Bob when he's when he's being Billy Bob Thornton and not trying to recreate Walter Matthau with the <laughs> with the lines that were given to Walter Matthau, I think it really works. I wish they would have said, "Hey, Link, later, do a movie about Bad News Bears, but just throw out the original script and like do it however you want to." It also feels like this is my other idea. My other thing about these movies is that I'm starting to see like he's taking certain movies as he's making Boyhood. Like he needs something to make while he's making Boyhood. Mm -hmm. And some of these feel that way. And also, too, it's weird because you go from, like, I think from Bad News Bears to Bernie, I'm starting to see, oh, this guy who's in Fast Food Nation is in Boyhood. And you're starting to see, like, oh, he must have been shooting Boyhood. And so that's why when he's making Fast Food Nation, Patricia Arquette's in it, Ethan Hawke's in it, and uh, the, bo the kid is in it as well. It's just like, oh, wait, that's why... And you're seeing some of the same character actors pop up from Scare Darkly and Boyhood as well. Anyway, Fast Food Nation, this is my first time watching it. It feels like this is like trying to be his Altman movie. Mm -hmm. We're seeing a lot of different storylines that never fully intersect, but they're all tied together because of the city they're in and because of like the uh, meat manufacturing plant. You've seen Fast Food Nation, right? I, it, I saw okay. it like when it came out we, it, okay. in high school, we read the book and... Um... Yeah, it's it's it was weird because the book is nonfiction. The book is yes. just a collection of anecdotes of like why fast food is bad, um, and they took it and turned it into a kind of narrative. Um, I just remember this came out around the same time as Thank You for Smoking, and and Thank You for Smoking was the superior of the two films at that time. Like, they felt very similar. I think Greg Kinnear is the best part of the movie. He's only in there for like the first hour of the film because it skips like two months later or whatever it is, and. Then you never see Greg Kinnear again because Greg Kinnear is like this marketing executive premise of Fast Food Nation for those that don't know. Um, 
this fast food company uh, gets word that some scientists have been testing their patties, these new patties called the big one, and they send Greg Kinnear down to the city where the patties are made because people believe they're being like, it's like basically cow shit is getting in the, uh, the hamburger patties. And he's sitting down to kind of investigate it. Don't know why, he's a marketing guy, but he's sitting down <laughs> to investigate this and he ends up like starts having doubts about what they're doing as a company and what like the whole like he when he's first there he like goes to the fast food place like i want one big one please and like so excited like oh i i market the big one and then by the end of it it's like every time he looks at a hamburger he's just like oh god what am i eating it starts to kind of change so i think his storyline is kind of the better one also the young girl like the thing the, the parts that i really love are the parts when like it's just like the teens who are like working at the fast food restaurant or greg Kinnear are talking with people and the movie weirdly link later i wouldn't say as a political director like say oliver stone but he does have political themes that run throughout his film specifically with fast food nation and the problem with me with this movie is that it gets very political in the second half and it loses some of the charm that i felt it had with like ashley johnson's character who plays amber where she's like working at the fast food restaurant has a bunch of high school friends and then the latter half she turns into kind of like an environmental activist with some college kids one of which is played by avril lavigne for some reason <laughs> i don't know if you remember that but yeah so you're mm. starting to see it, it's 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 fine it's not out. I'm not saying it's just worse. I think there, I, I think it's, it's definitely in the, again, the lost years of kind of just a few mediocre movies, but there's some good stuff in it. Uh, also Glenn Powell pops up for the first time in link later film in this movie for like one scene. Um, and then all the weirdest part, Bruce Willis is in this movie also for one scene. Hmm. And, and I actually like Bruce Willis in this movie because it's him and Greg Kinnear and Bruce Willis just kind of like saying like, dude, Sometimes shit gets in cow patties. What are we going to do? Shout out. You know what? Shout out Bruce Willis cameos in studio films by early 90s indie directors. Am I right? <laughs> what are the other ones? Tell us the other ones. Oh, I just meant Ocean's 12. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> mid 2000s, too. Like, what was Bruce Willis doing in the mid 2000s? Paying for a divorce. That might have been it. <laughs> I'm sorry, Bruce Willis. Anyway, uh, so that's Fast Food Nation. Moving on to uh, another rotoscope movie, uh, A Scanner Darkly, which I really liked. A lot of my friends who were once stoners were like, yeah, this was totally a stoner movie when it came out. I won't say one of their names because they were just like, yeah, man, I haven't watched it since my stoner days. And we loved it because it's dealing with this whole idea of paranoia and conspiracies and the, it's a it's a adaptation of a Philip K. Dick novel or novel, I believe. And it's about uh, this guy who is a drug addict who is also a detective. And he's supposed to be going undercover to find out where these drugs are coming from. And he ha it's it's a it's a it's a not a distant future, but a, 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 a short time in the future. And he was supposed to go undercover and not get hooked on drugs. He gets hooked on drugs and he's playing he's played by keanu reeves and keanu reeves his character lives in a house of robert danny jr and woody harrelson and his girlfriend's winona ryder it's such a weird cast for like mid-2000s where you think robert danny jr is now one of the biggest actors in the world i feel like woody harrelson was around in that period but is not what he is like now if that yeah. makes sense yeah he hadn't had the the harrelson -assance. So yeah, so like so the, like the chemistry between all four of them is actually really good, and it's just it is it, it the rose scoping thing is is weird at first, but I do think once you buy into it, it's a really cool like neo noir thriller with some great performances in it. And Downey, it's right when Downey's it's two years before Iron Man, and uh, a year I think a year before Zodiac. So this is kind of like his first like really like roll with a prestigious director before the big huge comeback of Downey, the Downey science. And then Scanner Darkly, and then briefly, because we're gonna bring this up in the next episode actually, he does a movie called Me and Orson Welles, which I think believe comes out in 2008. It's a little bit of his outlier because it's a period piece. It's a period piece and it it wasn't written by him. 
It takes place in like New York. They shot it in London, which most of his films always take place in Austin or maybe like LA adjacent in some way. And it, it, it has a very like traditional way of filmmaking. But one of my favorite scenes in the movie, and we'll play a clip of it, is this idea of Zach Efron. It's basically me and Orson Welles. Zach Efron's character is this high school student who gets cast in a Orson Welles play. And Orson Welles is uh, putting on a play at the Mercury Theater. It's his first mo- first play that he's putting on, on by himself. And it, it's a week in this life of this theater company before their big opening night. But there's this, a great scene that Zac Efron has with uh, Zoe Kazan when they're at a museum. And she's a writer and she talks about um, her the, script, the, the sto- short story she just wrote and she's talking about like what it is and zach efron asks about like oh what is it about she tells him and he goes okay what happens and so this scene establishes a big thing of linklater's career a plot versus story big question what is the difference between plot versus story to you i mean a story is the story like i don't know days confused has a story but it doesn't have a plot plot yeah exactly yeah there, there's no it's, there's no like built rising action or you know there's not going to be a climax but there's still a story like yeah um all of these everything has a story but everything doesn't necessarily have a plot or necessarily need to have a plot it's I, the the basic thing and i think it's kind of broken down the scene is like story is what is it about and a plot is what happens mm-hmm. i think i even heard scorsese one time he when he won he won his best director oscar for the departed and they're like, why do you think you finally won for The Departed and not the other movies? He goes, because this one has a plot. Because mm-hmm. when you watch The Departed, it's very much a, this happens, then this happens, then this happens. But when you look at something like Main Streets or Taxi Driver or Raging Bull, it's not really a plot. It's a character piece about this about this boxer, about this guy who's kind of, who's lonely and being isolated from the city in this big, huge city and slowly goes kind of insane. And Link later is a director who focuses pretty much on story and outside of maybe school of rock and his studio movies he it's mostly all story those movies are the plot movies that's Mm. why i think school of rock is such a a big accomplishment is because he was able to do a movie that was like plot driven but still have his voice in it that's my rant on story versus plot they're not the same thing stop calling it that (laughs) <laughs> but but me and orson wells was his biggest bomb of his career i think it was it was 25 million dollar budget made 2.3 million dollars so it was his biggest bomb i've also heard i i heard in an interview he did recently or a few years ago when he was promoting last flag flying he was like i he said that he thinks this is one of his best movies hmm. is me and orson wells and i think it's his most underrated film thomas hasn't watched it yet thomas will watch it before our next episode where we're going to talk about theater movies. So get ready for that. Um, so moving on. So we had a couple of failures with these lost years. And I think the big thing that happens is that Linklater gets back to his roots of Texas movies and the kind of some older stories that he'd done. So you have Bernie, you have Before Midnight, you have Boyhood, and you have Everybody Wants Some. A pretty great four movies in a row. Mm-hmm. So Bernie, can you tell us a little bit about Bernie, real quick? Yeah, Bernie's based on a on a true story um, about a a man who was there was a a small town in Texas and a woman who was very famous for being just the worst and everybody hated her and there was a a, a younger man who was her as they call it in the South companion and nobody <laughs> ever ever knew what the nature of their relationship was but everybody liked this guy and nobody liked her. But for some reason, she liked him and um, and she turned up dead and he got all of her money. And there was a whole investigation as to whether or not he had anything to do with her death. And yeah, they, got, they turned into this movie. And um, and this movie should not work. Yeah. Like it should not work to me. But it, it I think is arguably his most Texas movie because mm-hmm. it's shot like a docudrama. And you're seeing like, oh, Bernie was such a great guy. He was this, he was that. And they're like cutting back and forth. There's a whole bit at one point where one of the guys explains the divisions of Texas. He's Mm -hmm. like, we're East Texas. He's like, here's how we're different. He goes, then you have that, the, the Republic of Austin with all those artsy people. Like he's just like breaking it all down. And it's kind of amazing. Cause also again, Linklater is mainly from East Texas. So it feels like 
this is his like true like his real texas movie and at least uh, capturing the culture of it yeah and, whole- and it and it, it ties into that so we've talked about it in southern movies and especially in, in last picture show that kind of southern like gossip culture and, and everything yeah. is like repressed but everybody knows what's going on but nobody's talking about it and that's all important in, into this and also at, it takes about about 15 minutes or more into it but they start when they start cutting to mcconaughey it's so amazing mm. like mcconaughey is just so good in this movie this was <laughs> this was early mcconaissance this was um, yes very much so this pre dallas fires club not long after after mud right mud was before this this might have been uh, this might have been before mud but i do remember this i remember this being in the news not the news but like you know entertainment circles as yeah, yeah, yeah. a link later's back b he brought mcconaughey back with him and there it's both it's a lot of fun with both of them uh this was a year before uh mud wow so okay. you're se- you're seeing lincoln lawyer bernie and killer joe all in this year Mm. So this is like the very beginning of the Reconnaissance, and and he's amazing in it. And Jack Black's great, and Shirley MacLaine's great. It's also just like he only has three big actors in this movie, which I forgot about. And it's all just like local hires out of Austin, mm-hmm. or just the real people who live there or wherever they're at, like doing the documentary stuff. It's a again, and I I, I read that he was saying he's like, yeah, when you read the script, it reads so boring. Like, it feels so boring because you're just seeing all these people just, like, talk, talk, talk to camera. He's like, but I know the voices are going to make this good and interesting. And he was right. Then we get to Before Midnight. You just watched Before Midnight right before this episode. I, I immediately ended the movie and hopped on Skype. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on Before Midnight? And then I guess now we can talk about the whole series as a whole or the whole Before series as a whole. Yeah, I think I definitely benefited from watching it as a whole. I saw this one in theaters um, when it came out. And it was, I mean, it it felt like a big deal. I was not aware of the series when, before uh, Sunset came out. So I I, I didn't have the hype of like, oh my gosh, they're making a sequel to this. But this time it was like, I had seen both of them multiple times. And it was like, oh my gosh, they made another one. Um, And then you, and then you get in the, in the theater and you sit down and, and you get about halfway through the movie and it just turns into the final half of the film as a fight. And it, and it's, it's tough. It's, it's, yeah tough to watch these characters but it's it's real and and watching it this time too there's you know we were talking about him being earnest and him never being and link later never being mean-spirited and the fight in itself there's always he, he peppers it and 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 hawk and 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 uh Delpy, they were all co-writers and and you know it's i feel like it's important that you know they hawk and Delpy as, as writers and as people are just important to this series as as link later is and they, there's always these little moments peppered in when just when it starts to get like too heavy, there's there's a joke when you just kind of go like, hmm. and it and it really helps. It really yeah. really helps. And and um, and and you know it feels like I talked about how the first two movies were about watching them fall in love. And there's there's a moment in this movie when you go, is this movie about them falling out of love? But it's not. It's just about them living living in love. Yeah. Yeah. And, and realistically what happens when you share your life with a person for 10 years and, and, and you both go through life, not turning out the way you thought it would. I, I loved it. I, I, it's, it's, I, it's hard to rank them all. I, I, I think I, I rank before sunset as the highest, just because I love that they shot it in real time. And I love the, 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 you know, technical aspects of it, but I, I they're all incredible and watching. I, I've really, really enjoyed watching them as, as like a solid piece. Yeah. And, and with before midnight, it's 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 almost a blend of before sunrise and sunset because it feels like there's only like seven scenes in before midnight mm-hmm. like the first like the it had the car ride at the beginning of the movie where it just feels like 15 minutes of just of those of them two talking with the kids in the back seat and it's and it's like you also get the idea of like the parenting and the marriage of it where it's like when they're driving and they're just like oh there are the ruins the kids wanted to stop there he goes let's not wake him up let's just keep driving Mm -hmm. and then like the first thing they do when they wake up are we going to the ruins they're like oh no they were closed Mm -hmm. like it's just it captures not just the 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 love aspect of it and the marriage or the they're not they're not married actually but the the partnership they have and then the parenting they have to deal with and the struggle of like having a kid across the country ethan hawk's character yeah i think i i actually didn't really love this movie the first time i watched it i think because it definitely does not have that romanticism as much as the first two do. 
it's definitely like some people uh, find it even goes as far because i mean visually the, the first two are so romantic because you're walking through these european streets and everything and you, you the, it, this one does it walks you through the streets of greece and they're they're they are being romantic and then when it when it's time for the fight it puts you in a hotel room and it says yeah. all right you don't get those visuals anymore because this is this is real this is going to get real but yeah and I, and I think watching it as a whole that you it, it does help to realize that like this feels incredibly authentic to what these people's lives these characters are so well realized throughout these movies um and 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 it does you, when you watch it as a whole you go oh this is 100 percent what that 23 year old jesse would be like as a 41 year old that is it's this this feels absolutely like the path that he was on um and and celine as well then he does boyhood also tile the the 12 year project i'm gonna let you lead this one thomas you, you carry yeah. this you tell me tell me what you want to do so so yeah boyhood was shot over 12 years about and about just a boy growing up and it drops in every it drops in for about 20 minutes or less than that sometimes sometimes less than five minutes um every year and you just see his life and and his um his sister is played by link later's daughter and his um uh, parents are played by patricia arquette and ethan hawk and i i love this movie i've watched it three or four times now i it, it feels like a it feels like a companion piece to the before series in the way that he captures real people changing over real time mm -hmm. um and that's i i've always told you anyone i've, I've known who watched it and and didn't love it i think part of the reason is as as great as link later is at casting actors the kid that he chose did not grow up to be a great actor lr coltrane is is great as a kid but at some point in high school he just kind of loses it and he feels a little wooden by the end of it i i, I can see i think it happens right at the middle of the movie yeah I yeah, there's a scene when that movie. girl when, he, when he's rolling he's he's doing his bike down he's like ro walking down the alley with his bike and he's talking to a girl that is when you go oh yeah <laughs> that's that's the same that's the same where i like oh okay yeah because um, well, because because i don't think he has a lot of dialogue before he has a great look and he has like good moments where like when he's not saying dialogue but that's the first big scene because he's gotten older. He has the responsibility of I can carry this long walk and talk, and just something about he's always looking down. It's just there's something about it that just doesn't work for me. Yeah, and and I know some other people I know who didn't like it said I literally had someone tell me one time there's a scene when they're um, they have a, a, a stepfather who has a drinking issue and there's a scene when he's driving and and he's visibly drunk and someone said I really hope they would crash. So something would happen. And I think like we were talking about plot versus story. Yeah, like there, yeah. there is not a plot in this. There, There's like, not. Nothing's nothing magnificent happens in this kid's life. Nothing out of the ordinary happens in this kid's life, which I loved about it. But but what I've always told people who watched it and had such a problem with the, the child actor is this movie is about his parents. The the people who change in this movie are his parents and, and their changes have some effects on him. But the, the character arcs through this movie are ethan hawks and patricia arquette's and i think they are incredibly well performed and incredibly well realized and it and it and it's i think we are it's truly incredible for like film history that we have these two and especially that ethan hawk is involved in both but these two capsules of like p adults aging in real time and and seeing like realistic depictions of what growing up as an adult feels like like maturing from your like 20s through your 40s um but i that that is my what i take away every time i watch this movie is hawk and arquette and um their their character journeys through raising this child and and i think sometimes it's because it's called boyhood and because you're following the kid i think you lose sight of that sometimes but i think that's the heart of the movie um and it's incredibly well done in my opinion What'd you think, Brandon? <laughs> That's what I was waiting for. So, I, I, we saw this movie. I think when I, right after when I moved to LA, saw it at the Landmark mm -hmm. Theater. I was, I was driving, I was driving to LA when it came out. I, I literally had a conversation with a woman at a museum in New Mexico. I went to, I went to this random roadside museum, and I said, she said, "Oh, what brings you here?" And I said, "Oh, I'm moving to Los Angeles." And she said, "Oh, what for?" 
And I said, I said, you go to go to film school. And she said, have you seen boyhood? <laughs> <laughs> I so, said, not yet. So I had been keeping track of this movie weirdly since high school. I had heard about it and I was like, Ooh, that's a, how is he going to pull that off? Cause I don't know if I was, I, I was aware of link later. I was like somehow like cruising like Wikipedia and seeing filmographies. And, and it said like boyhood or 12 year project or something like that. And I was just like, is he really going to shoot this for 12 years? Like, is this actually going to be a thing? So I was really hyped about this movie. And I was at Sundance that year for a class when boyhood, like all of a sudden became a film there, like two weeks, two or three weeks before they announced it was a surprise thing. And I get there and everyone I talked to was like, Oh my God, it's amazing. It's going to blow your mind. And so it was really hyped up for me. I go into it. And when I watched it, I was like, that was good. Like I didn't, I didn't love it when I saw it. I felt it was slow. And again, we're going on this idea. I also, there were parts where I was like, man, I wish something happens in this movie. Like there's a part when he, they're like chucking like, uh, like saw blades or whatever. And I'm like, man, will someone get hit and like they have to go to the hospital? See, I, or, I love that. Or they're, something. They're, they're kicking around an old construction site. And I'm like, I, how many times did I do that? And like, I, I, not. yeah, <laughs> no, they haven't. I'm getting there. I'm just yeah. getting my niche, my, my original yeah, views yeah, yeah. on yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I got you. I got you. And so I was just like, oh, and, and I didn't like, and I still kind of don't like this actually, is that the, the, the criticism of it was just, I felt like it was too highly praised. I still think that. I feel like people were just like, oh my god like even even after it lost the oscars they were just like birdman might have won but time will show that boyhood was the greatest film of this decade and i'm like hold on now it's not that so i i didn't like it and i've also talked a lot of crap about it over the past few years because i didn't like it uh and i finally rewatched it for this episode and i really do like this movie yes <laughs> <laughs> I really do like this movie and I think the issues that there's, I still have issues with certain things. Mm -hmm. It's not perfect. It's not perfect. Uh, like I would love to see the daughter a little bit more. I love to see this, but just the feat of what he did. I now get why it was just so like, how it was, how is he able to get all these people together and really show the transition of it? And also to, I think it's just age. I was 22 when I saw it. I'm now 28 going on 29. And I'm now remembering all like the nostalgic things it's bringing up of the time. Cause it very much is this like nostalgic trip of like, Oh, Harry Potter and the half or a half blood Prince um, release party or soldier boy being a big hit back in my day with, with, uh, with cranked at like all that he's using music cues from the eras. He's using pop culture reference. There's at like one point there's a kid singing a high school musical song. I'm like, I knew people like that that did that. Like, it, it with age I, it's really it definitely captured some of the things that were being talked about some of the culture that was happening uh in my life at that time and i do think ethan hawk i've always thought ethan hawk and patricia arquette were great in it and i do agree with you uh it is about their arcs it's the whole like ethan hawk's character is the dude driving a muscle car and is like the kind of the the, the father that comes in out of their lives who's smoking cigarettes and all that. And then by the end of it, he's driving a minivan with a kid. He's now married. He like works at an insurance company. He's given up on music. And you've had that whole arc of this character and you've seen it through time, which is what happens to people. You have adults mm -hmm. who like are really holding on to those, like those teenage dreams of being a musician or being a writer, or being an artist. And I wouldn't say conform, but they just, they realize that maybe that's not the thing for them. Maybe they, their, their passions and something else, maybe their focus should be more on family than it was before. And that's the whole thing is that he, he realizes that he should have been there more for his kids, his, his first two kids. And now he's trying to rewrite the wrongs with this new, with his new, this new son and his new wife. I love the, I love the, the like way he, there's a scene when he pulls up in like a minivan and he like apologizes and like i love he, he's he is someone who like never wanted to mature but he has yeah and he almost like is ashamed of it yeah 
and then it, you, you're you're going to talk about Princess Trish Arquette. It's like in in direct like the dual. There's this duality of the way that the two of them what they want at the beginning of the movie and what ends up happening for both of them and it's it's almost tragic i think yeah because her character i think he told me it was like her character like never really progresses she wants to change she he, wants to he change. doesn't want to mature ethan hawk doesn't want to mature but he does yeah and she wants to so bad yeah and she can't she can't ever quite like break out of i don't want to say her shell but like she can't ever quite like break through to what she, what she wants to be in life and i don't say routine but it's like she ends up falling for the same like drunken dudes that like either abuse her or abuse her kids or are verbally abusive or physically abusive to either of them and it's like she keeps falling for those same guys and it's either like it's a it's her professor at first, then it's her then it's her I think students. It feels like it another time. Mm -hmm. It's like she keeps falling into these same patterns, and then kind of by the end, she ends up like they start a small house and they start building up. By the end of the movie, she's living in her mom's apartment. Mm -hmm. Like it's a nothing's gone right for her. Well, it, it took I it took me showing my mom this movie to really my. I, I showed it to my mom and I, I kind of talked to her about it afterwards. And there's a, the, the last moment that Patricia Arquette has in the movie is her, her son's getting ready to go to college. And she like, she like very briefly like guilts him for leaving her. And my, and my mom said that is so immature of her to do that as a, as a mother and as a person. And I, I, I was like, wow, I'd never thought of it that way. But like, yeah, she, she has not, like it, it's really her her arc is is really tragic but like she's someone who had so much ambition and wanted so much for herself and like isn't able to to break out of her her like you know she's she's not able to overcome herself well it's 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 that's what she's like or she says in that scene of like i thought it'd be so much harder for you it's like it's hard for her that she, he's leaving but it's not hard for him and she's trying to guilt and like make him feel bad that like He's just like, yeah, I'm going to college. I mm. will say too that you're talking about how people change. You do see, I noticed this time is that when he's dry, when he's gotten older and he's about to go to college, he's essentially having the same convert. Like he sounds like his dad. He sounds like mm -hmm. Ethan Hawke in the first few like scenes when you first see Ethan Hawke. Like, oh, I read this article where I saw I was talking about this, and then all of a sudden you see him when he's like 17. Oh, I was reading this article yesterday about Facebook, and I'm like, oh wait. He's become his father. He's driving this beat up truck. He likes this truck, this kind of like manly like thing that he's doing. And he's, he's always informing people about something they don't know. And that's kind of, that's kind of Mason senior, Ethan Hawke's character. That's kind of what he does. The early on part is like, Hey, don't think that way. Think like this, like the stuff I read and everything. So it's, it's interesting seeing that. And I didn't notice that the first time. But it also just shows like how you're saying how the parents have an effect on kids and how their thoughts and their minds uh, are molded by them, either as a way they, they conform and believe what their parents say or they rebel and revolt against it like he does in his like mid teen years. Mm -hmm. So I liked it more. Nice. So there you go. I, I I I'm now on. And technically, the it's incredible. Like uh, that, you, oh, you kind of have to amazing. separate that. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 crazy how how they're able to do that. It's amazing. So moving on from Boyhood to Everybody Wants Some. Everybody Wants Some. I I think I heard heard Linklater say that like he never. He, this is in 2017. I don't know if it's still true, but he was saying he's never like really like lost out to a studio in terms of like losing the his vision of a movie. But he's like, but I have lost in terms of like the release. And he said, with Everybody Wants Some paramount really didn't give any effort to releasing this movie on a larger scale but weirdly it has kind of developed a little bit of a following in the way may not to the same extent but in a way as dazed and confused so thomas what does everybody want some about uh yeah it's set in like the three days before college starts when like students are moving in on a friday and and classes start on monday and uh, it, it follows mainly of the uh, college freshman who's coming in to be a pitcher on the baseball team. And they're supposedly the it's what is Texas Southern University, I think it's uh, called or yeah, Southern Texas, so. Southern Texas, something like that. But they're they're supposedly the greatest baseball team in the country. Yeah. Um, and it's it's just about him getting hazed and getting being friends with the becoming friends with the boys on the baseball team and kind of like figuring out what 
college life is going to be like and meeting a girl and um it a lot like days confused and i think as we see pe- i think the thing with days confused too is like i think as we see these people become more famous we'll see people come back to yeah. this movie yeah um but like days confused link later cast a like fairly like young unknown group of actors yeah. um who have eventually turned into the the um, romantic the female lead is is played by zoe deutsch the the kind of like upperclassman who takes the main character under his wing is played by glenn powell who zoe deutsch and glenn powell were in set it up on netflix together yep well blake jenner the main character was also in um uh edge of 17 and american animals, american animals which is yeah. incredible watch american yeah. animals um yeah j quentin johnson who, who is also one of the the main like upperclassmen um is, is has is or has been in hamilton since okay I think um, you're right. yeah, yeah and wyatt russell uh kurt russell's son so yeah uh i think yeah and well and also um tyler hetchlin who was a, a child actor who's the kid from um road to perdition oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> you're right just got that one just got that one yeah yeah he was on seventh heaven too but yeah like a like a really fun young cast and um and we're already starting to see them you know go on to do bigger things but i i think as as they get more you know like you go back and show people days confused and you go yeah there's ben affleck like well, i think everybody wants some will get yeah. more acclaim when you can go there's glenn powell like the yeah, guy yeah. from top gun 2 you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> maverick yeah yeah that's I think it will happen, but I think it's a. I do think Glenn Powell, Wyatt Russell, and Zoe Deutsch to me are like the 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 trinity of the movie. Like yeah. in terms of dialogue, like hearing Glenn Powell, because like you're thinking about Ethan Hawke as the guy who's like essentially the surrogate for Linklater in terms of how he's like spewing these philosophical conversations and comments and like kind of uh, is usually these kind of eccentric characters, <laughs> and Glenn Powell fully buys into that. Like Glenn Powell totally in this movie, that. and I, I had forgotten how much I in, in this movie he blew me away. But Glenn Powell in this movie has like it, yeah, capital I T it. It's <laughs> it's like it's like Bill Murray meatballs. It's like Chevy Chase. It's like Eddie Murphy in uh, in Beverly Hills Cop. It's just like you watch it and you're like, this guy's magnetic. He's he's definitely buying into the Linklater like universe or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I think Wyatt Russell's the next one up that does that. Yeah. There's a couple of these in here, like everybody wants some, I think like me and Orson Welles that need to be more discovered from the Linklater catalog. And I mm-hmm. think this is one of them. Well, and I think like, I mean, there's several things, you know, he's, he's kind of called it the spiritual sequel to Days Confused. And there, there's a lot of similarities. And for instance, when you're talking about them fumbling the, the distribution of it, I remember when the first trailer for this came out, I was really excited for this movie. And the first trailer came out and I kind of went, uh, and then I, I had to make myself think, I, I thought I've never seen a trailer for Days and Confused and I had to go, how would I cut a trailer for Days and Confused? You can't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so that, that was going into it. I, I, I had to remind myself that, but um, I think it's also one of those movies that needs to, it, it improves upon rewatching. So it, it does, needs it time does. for people to see it over and over again. I, I, I still think, especially, and I've told you this, I think Amazon prime had it for a while. It's not currently streaming, but I think if it could land on like a Netflix, um, I think it could really blow up. Moving on to what I call, where are we now? <laughs> where'd you go? Link where, later? where'd you go? Link later? So <laughs> we have, we have two movies back to it. We'll have last flag flying and where'd you go? Burn a debt. I, I need to rewatch last flag flying. It's been, a, it's, I haven't seen it since it was like released in Oscar season or whatever. I don't remember loving it. I remember, it be, I remember liking it and liking the three characters it's about like essentially it's it's a steve carell brian cranston lars fishburne are these vietnam war veterans who reunite this is also a reoccurring theme of of a reunion this is like the third movie in his catalog that's done this um they reunite because steve carell's son has died in the iraq war and he needs help to to, he asks his two former friends from vietnam to help him go on a road trip to get his son's body and bring it back so it can be buried and it's based it's it's kind of a it's a it's a novel sequel to the to the novel the last detail which is made into a movie starring jack nicholson where it's about these two vietnam war vets who have to take essentially the the younger steve carell character essentially like to navy prison or whatever because he's done something illegal this is the sequel to that it's it's good it's it's of the early 2000s so it has kind of this like a little bit of nostalgic view not nostalgic but like 
the technology of the air and kind of the thoughts of the air, but just it's something's just not clicking. And I feel that same way about Where'd You Go, Bernadette. Like you see the tropes of Linklater in both these films. Where'd You Go, Bernadette is essentially about this character played by Kate Blanchett, who's an architect, who's kind of become a recluse and has essentially lost her way in terms of like um, her artistry. And she's lost her voice and she doesn't do architecture anymore, but she was this one great, she's a great architecture that's like being being forgotten and it the 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 trailer was marketed in terms of marketing with this it it was marketed as like a mystery film and like oh my god where did she go and and i always felt like it was like a movie where like in the first 20 30 minutes of the movie bernadette's left and no one knows where she is and they're trying to find her that's not what happens in this movie like it's definitely about this artist who's lost her way who's trying to find it and she doesn't dis- she doesn't leave until like an hour into the movie. That was my joke. I was like, I'm watching a movie called Where'd You Go, Bernadette? And she hasn't gone anywhere yet. <laughs> uh, I'm an hour into it. But I, I get that it's about this artist who's lost their way. And it's just something about it. I think bo- I do kind of consider both these films studio films. Mm-hmm. Even though it's Link later and they have kind of an indie voice to it, I do feel like there is a studio thing on it. I don't know. Yeah, I don't. I, Where'd you go, Bernadette? Was a hugely successful book, and yeah. I, it doesn't. I don't know the facts behind this, but it doesn't. It feels like a studio bought it and then approached Linklater. It doesn't feel like Linklater was like, "This is, yeah, this is my book. I want to do because it was. It was a big, big book, and um, and yeah, it feels like they were just trying to attach it to a director, and it ended up with him. Yeah, and so it, I, 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 I'm, I, I hesitate to say it's his worst film because it's it's brand new and i've only seen it one time and and and, and as i'm finding out with linklater films they kind of need rewatches they need they need time they need, they need time to help it out ironically where they, they improve with time and i just it it did i didn't grab me it just felt kind of it felt too clean that's another thing that i think some of the things he's lost in terms of like the way it looks that he had so much earlier is that it felt of the era and i think even everybody wants some it feels too nowadays and too digital and too clean than what his earlier films had Mm -hmm. so that's my that's my view on these two films uh and then he has boyhood 2.0 with uh merrily we roll along which is uh he's doing a musical adapt a a film adaptation of the musical and he's gonna shoot over 20 years the 20 year project the 20 year project i think he's gonna be 79 when he's done with it, he's currently 59, so he'd be 79 when he finishes it. So I don't know. I I I I'm intrigued. Yeah. Yep. Apparently, apparently it's done in reverse chron- like a, a chronology. So like, you have to like, you need the ending for the movie to work. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's my thing. You need the movie. So it's like you you're really waiting for a while to get the beginning of the movie. Apparently uh so anyway that's that's our that's the the end of our dive into the link layer filmography now for our last parts our stats and final questions unless you have anything else to say about the filmography no i think we covered I it think, i think we've got we we've done a very deep dive in the link later guys um so stats i feel like you can guess some of these um most popular film on letterbox on our letterbox list that we have called dazed and confused like most, most seen po- most seen Dacing a few. No, School of Rock. No. No. Think Letterbox, Thomas. Before Sunset. I mean, Before Sunrise. No. Dacing a few. No. Boyhood. Yes. 270,000 views on Letterbox. Uh, least popular. Least seen. Uh, uh, his uh, original. It's impossible to learn to plow by reading book. Correct. That is correct. That is his least popular. Highest Top three highest rated films. You can get this. Just, the before trilogy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> guess the ranking. I'm gonna guess it just goes, just goes as is. Yep. But sunrise, sunset, this, midnight. Yeah, but I will say this: sunrise and sunset both have a 4.3 out of five. Uh-huh. So it's it's kind of tied. Lowest rated films. Uh, Fast Top, Food Nation. Bottom three. That's that's number three. Uh, Suburbia. <laughs> no. No, people in Letterbox like Suburbia. I looked up the reviews it's after like a, I got done with it's it. It's like a 3.2. Um, uh, the Newton Boys. The Newton Boys is number two. Tape. No. Tape's, tape's pretty high. Tape's pretty high. Tape is like a 3.4, 3.5. Bird. 
Bernadette? No, that's around like a, a 2.9 or 3. I don't, know. I don't know. What's the last one? Bad News Bears, 2.6. Really? Yeah. Wow. Bad News Bears, 2.6. Newton Boys, 2.8. Fast Food Nation, 2.8. So there you go. And I, and I think I think next might be uh, It's Impossible to Learn to Plow by Reading Books. Uh, here's an easy one. Softball. Most appearances. Even hot. <laughs> yep. <laughs> How many? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Eight. Eight. He has eight. Before sunrise. Before oh, yeah, sunset, tape. I was forgetting tape. Before midnight, the Newton boys, waking life, tape fast food nation boyhood oh, and, and newton boys yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. boyhood so he's yep. he, he, eight and then I, mcconaughey i only guess has, you know go go back in time to that guy sitting in the the theater watching days confused and he be was like, just hey, man. so upset man he's like gotta be in his movies and then essentially <laughs> so think about that so he did three movies at that point i think he's done 20 movies so far so that means uh ethan hawk has been in eight of the 17 so almost wow. half of his movies after that, Ethan Hawke has been a part of. Um, uh, final questions. Uh, first up, for people who are listening, where should they start? What link player film should they start with? I think Days of Confused. Okay. That's how I, my girlfriend had not seen, mo- other than School of Rock, she had not seen any of his movies. And okay. um, we start with Days of Confused. If you haven't seen School of Rock already, maybe that. Yeah. But um, but I think Days of Confused is a really good, it's, it's a really user-friendly intro into his style I agree. whereas school of rock doesn't necessarily feel as much like oh this is like this is link later like this yeah, is yeah, his yeah. time and 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 conversations about life and all that kind of stuff um i think days confused is, is you start with days confused and then you do maybe everybody wants some i'd say days confused before trilogy and then everybody wants some is a fun little like uh, yeah, palate cleanser yeah and then you can and then dive in however you will after that dive in the deep end we've kind of covered it but how is link player texas after looking at all of his filmography what are some things that popped up i mean definitely the the, the feeling i think that that's the kind of the crazy thing the, the well the interesting thing about having worked in this genre and we've studied all this stuff and to now watch someone who is from texas make movies outside of texas i think that feeling of like being stuck yeah. and like the vastness has has expanded into like everything um but i also think and i I gotta throw this out there this we haven't really talked about this but like the 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 i think you know the the sincerity and and the earnestness and everything we've been talking about that is that is part of his texas upbringing i think you know if someone who was raised in new york city set out to make a movie that was just dialogue about life it would not come out as it would not feel as like completely like I don't want to use the word pretentious, but like it, you, humbled and and, yeah, and yeah. earnest as as his stuff does. Yeah, and I and I think uh, I definitely think like that that the the feeling of being trapped and like the vastness of of Texas has turned into like the vastness of life for him, and and yeah. maybe that's where all this this time stuff comes from. Yep, yeah, I agree. Um, is Linklater in our tour? Yeah, one hundred percent. And Ethan Hawke's a surrogate. I think Ethan Hawke's is like philosophical type surrogate and McConaughey's is bro surrogate. Yep. Like, uh, yeah, uh, that's 100%. Just, that's kind of what it is. I wish that, I wish the kid, I, I, I was thinking this this time watching Everybody Wants Some, I wish the kid that plays the catcher, the freshman catcher, uh-huh. I wish he was a better actor because he looks like Linklater. Like he would be a fantastic like Linklater stand in. He would, yeah, yeah, yeah. They have the same shaped face. Could have been good. And then uh, and Buter or Buford or whatever that, that other guy's Buter. name is yeah beauter man I, I went to high school with a guy like that actually the same guy i went to high school with that's been foster in hell or high water is beauter from everybody wants to <laughs> well. wow shout out shout out twice in the series <laughs> so my high school but one of my high school best friends okay if you're casting a link later movie like an altman x story maybe it's a mini series or whatever out of his ensemble of people that he's used throughout his career who are the 10 actors you pick uh McConaughey. Okay. Hawk. Okay. Delpy. Yep. Glenn Powell. Yeah, okay. That's 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 the, these are mine right now. Wyatt Russell. Okay. Um All right, this the 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 back five I'm going to try and surprise you a little bit. Jack Black. 
I'll yeah, give you Jack Black. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I'll give you that one. Um, I really like J. Quentin Johnson and Everybody Wants Some. Okay. I would bring him back. Parker Posey, 100%. Yeah, 100%. First of all, I just, I, I love Parker Posey, but Parker Posey is so good in Days and Confused. Yep. I'm bringing back the dude that played Don in Days and Confused. I don't know what he's up to in life, <laughs> but he's so good in that movie. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, one more left, I think. We were doing ten. Yeah, I got I got one left, dude. That's nine. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to pull too much from everybody who wants some, but you know I love young talent, Zoe Deutsch. Yeah, that's that. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, I I I would maybe throw in Greg Kinnear for one of those for me because he's popped up in two Linklater's films and I really like him in both films. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that because those are uh, Deutsch is one I would because I, I feel like a lot of dudes are in that top ten. So you got like I think Deutsch is one of his, and then Patricia Arquette might also be mm. right on the outskirts. Maybe I'm not sure. Depends yeah, on what choos- the story is. I was choosing is. between the two of them for that last role, yeah. but um... yeah, it, it depends on what the story is. You know, yeah, like I don't know what the story is. It's 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 a uh, actually it's just all South by Southwest. Like early 1990s, you're at a music festival in Austin, and you're just following all these people. There you go. That's your show or movie. Um, anything else? Oh, next month. So we're ending Texas month right now. We're moving into June, so we have a new genre. We're looking at theater movies. So you have a week to prepare. <laughs> We're doing a month of theater movies. There's no Tonys this year, but we wanted to kind of look at theater as a genre in terms of film. I, a lot of people, there's some confusion of what is a theater movie, and we're going to discuss it. We're going to bring up me and Orson Welles again next week uh, because that's one of the more recent theater movies that I think is worth watching. And I'm doing my best to pressure people to go watch me and Orson Welles if you can, because I do think it's one of Linklater's best. I think it's his most underrated film, actually. Um, and it's worth seeing and hopefully can. I'm not saying we're going to give it a life of its own, or a new life, but hopefully some people will discover it from this podcast. So stay tuned for that. Subscribe to us on our podcast and Spotify. Uh, give us a rating. Give us a review. Um, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Look at, look at our medium stuff. And I think that's it. Thomas, as always, thank you for diving into this link later. I mean, I don't know if I can watch a link later film for a while after this. It's been a real pleasure, man. Well, we've <laughs> watched almost all of them. I know. I've literally, I'm, I can, I'm, pro- I'm probably doing an article because I've watched so many in a short amount of time. I could turn around and watch. I could watch Days of Confused tonight. I really could. <laughs> that's gonna I be my. La- that's gonna be my last one. That's rewatched. Probably Days and Confused. And you know what? It, 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 we did it so seamlessly. The listeners might not realize this, but we recorded this podcast in real time <laughs> in a car driving actually in paris the, in paris <laughs> again guys thank you so much for listening go watch some link later films and we hope you listen to more episodes soon bye <laughs>